Shalom, brothers and sisters. This week's Thursday's thought, I want to continue talking about this idea of the wilderness. And I want to bring it into a Latter-day Saint perspective. In the Book of Mormon, if you remember King Noah and Abinadi and the wicked priest of Noah, there was a church. It was led by priests and overseen by the king. And they were wicked. They taught people to do wicked things. <clears throat> and eventually, Abinadi is called in. He's The Lord's called him to talk to them about Teshuvah, coming back, and repentance. And he goes over the Ten Commandments and some other things with these priests. And one of them has a change of heart. He comes to Christ. His name is Alma. Now remember, when we're reading the Book of Mormon, we're reading the scriptures, in Mormon Kabbalah, we are these people. So we are King Noah. We we have this wicked desire to lead people astray. We are the wicked priests that are enabling the king and, and leading other desires into wickedness. And we're also a Benedi, calling ourselves to Teshuva, to repentance. And we're also Alma, being converted. And fleeing into the wilderness. Now, one of the interesting things that I learned in translating the plates of brass is that the word Mormon actually means wilderness. And I think that's very interesting because since it's the Book of Mormon, it's a book about us, our journey into the wilderness. It, it is this this book that that takes us away from creeds and organized religion and into the the pure religion. Of just having a relationship, a personal relationship with God, with Jesus Christ. Keep in mind the Book of Mormon wasn't given to us to bring us into some church. It was given to us to testify of Jesus Christ. To help us know through the spirit of prophecy and revelation that God is real. So that we can begin building that relationship ourselves and enjoy the spiritual gifts and the fruits of the Spirit. So what does Alma do? He flees to the wilderness once he's converted. And others that are converted, they flee to the wilderness. They flee to Mormon, to Mormonism. And this is what I find through the ministry I've been called to, the Latter-day Saints are doing right now. We're fleeing these churches of men. And, and I'm not saying that they're, all churches of men are wicked or that they're all led by wicked priests or anything like that. But the creeds, no matter what, how good our intentions are, our creeds end up alienating people, dividing us as a people, as Israel. And so as we realize that these divisions, these creeds are, are man-made and not as relevant as a personal relationship, we flee into the wilderness. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we leave whatever church that we're in. Not everyone becomes a non-denominational Mormon. However... Those of us that begin building that personal relationship, we begin to rely less and less on the arm of man and more and more on the inspiration and teachings of God. And so we're there in the wilderness. And what do we do? We begin gathering the other righteous desires inside of ourselves. And in a real way, we begin finding each other. We begin working as one in Christ in these small little pockets, wherever we find each other, whether it's online or locally where we live. And this then becomes the church. Now remember, from my perspective, the church is you, it's me, it's us individually. And when we collectively get together and fellowship as, as Christians, then that's a different type of church. Now, we're not an organization. We don't have to have ground rules. You don't, you know, you have to do this or you're out. But we are able to fellowship in Christ. And that's why I prefer, because of the way that the word church is used today, I prefer to call church a fellowship. Because it's more about how we can help each other grow and less about how we can coerce people into conforming. But we have to spend time in the wilderness. And what do we do out there? We are baptized. When Alma does his first baptism, the first thing he does is he calls everyone to Teshuvah. He says, hey, you know, this is what it means to be a Christian. 
This is what it means to be Israel. We're going to mourn with those that mourn. We're going to care for each other. We're going to endure to the end. And when he baptizes himself and the first person and at the same time, and then later on goes on to baptize everyone else, this isn't the Christian baptism that we think of today, where, okay, we're going to get baptized to join some church. This is more, I mean, remember, he's under the law of Moses. These people are still under the law of Moses. So they're doing this ritual washing more in the eyes of the way that the Jews see it, the way that Israel saw it at that time, the way that John the Baptist saw it. You've done things. You're turning your life around. This is a ritual washing, and you're going to move forward. It doesn't mean you're joining some organization. It means that you are, are washing yourself clean and renewing yourself as a part of your spiritual journey. And the Holy Ghost fell upon them. But then something else happens. The Lamanites end up coming to destroy King Noah and his people. And the people that are left are placed into bondage. And those wicked desires inside of us, they go and they find these righteous desires and they, they try to capture them, Alma and his people. They move from place to place around the wilderness. That's what we do on our journey. We're going through the wilderness. We're learning from the Book of Mormon, from the Bible, from Doctrines of the Saints or Doctrines of the Covenants, depending on what version you read. Pearl Great Price, if you're from Salt Lake City Church, and other books if you're from other parts of the Restoration. But we're out there in the wilderness. We're, we're building that relationship with God where there's a war inside of us where the righteous desires are trying to flee from the wicked desires. And likewise, the wicked desires are trying to conquer and destroy the righteous desire and place them in bondage because they want egoism. They want pride. They don't want to build a relationship with God. They don't want to help others through altruism. They want to take, these desires want to take for themselves. And when you look at this, you see this in actual churches too. Every church, you know, there's the church of God and the church of the devil, according to the Book of Mormon. And that isn't literally this particular church, whatever, and this particular church, whatever. Every church has members of both churches inside of them. Every organization has them. You have your righteous and wicked people. It's, it's, you know, Peter talks about this, uh, Paul talks about this in the New Testament, where you have the wolves in, in sheep's clothing, leading people astray, teaching things like the prosperity gospel, which I've talked about before, this idea that you're really not working to build a personal relationship with God, you're working because you're trying to get financial rewards, and, and that is your blessing from God, that somehow, however rich you are, wealthy you are, and the more that you give, the less the wealthy you can get, the more God loves you. It's, it's not how it works. It's about building a personal relationship. So, in the real world and inside of ourselves, we're in a wilderness. We're out there struggling, and we feel like we're alone. Even though there's other people around us. Even though there's other people around us that believe similar than we do sometimes. It still feels alone. Because those wicked desires inside of us and the wicked desires outside of us, the, the wicked people around us, they want to, us to feel trapped and like we can't do it, like we're not good enough. Now, eventually, Alma does lead the people back to the uh, King Mosiah and the, the, the Nephites. And just like that inside of us, as long as we keep pressing forward, eventually we do get to that point to where we, we, we make it home. But we have to spend that time in the wilderness. We have to do that because we need that isolation, that time to find out for ourselves who we are. God already knows everything about us. So there's really no point in sending us here because God doesn't need us to prove anything to him. The reason why we're here is to prove to ourselves so we can see for ourselves. And we already know too. But we still have to go through it. I know what a cake is going to look and taste like. 
I still have to bake the cake. And because we're finite beings, sometimes when we bake that cake, it doesn't turn out very good. We have to remake it. And that's okay. Because making cake is always awesome. It's the same thing here. We're going to strive, we're going to do our best, but in the eternity of eternities, the small mistakes we make here aren't going to have the same lasting consequences that they seem to have from our finite perspective here upon the earth. It's interesting because the small things that we do, someone said recently that People talk about the idea of going back in time and they're so afraid that they kill a mosquito or do something very small, it's going to dramatically change things in the future. But we don't think about our impact on things now and we think that what we do doesn't matter. And there's two sides to this. In one aspect, it's true. A billion years from now, is it really going to matter if you stole a loaf of bread? Is it really going to matter if you gave someone a loaf of bread? You have the egoism there and the altruism. And the reason why I say it doesn't is because through repentance, through teshiva, the bad things that we do can be washed clean, they can be purified, and they won't be as relevant. So they don't need to weigh us down. But at the same time, everything that we do, every action causes a reaction. Every bit of good that we put into the world is a ripple, and it echoes out, doing more good. Now, yes, there's a choice. You may set up that ripple and someone say, oh, I'm going to use egoism. I'm going to break that ripple and make my own ripple and take for myself. But the same is true of wickedness. When someone does something bad, yeah, you hurt people, and that can make people decide they want to lash out or do wicked things themselves. But there can also be someone that says no. And through altruism, grabs a hold and breaks that ripple and creates a new one. And so there's just ripples everywhere, all throughout the waters of, of time and of life, all breaking into each other. And so then once again, it becomes a matter of, well, there's so much, does it really become relevant? And rather than obsessing on that, my thought for today for you is twofold. One, we go to the wilderness to help discover ourselves, to grow in our relationship with God, and that can cast out more ripples so that we, the light of Christ shines through us, and we bring others to Christ, not through our own deeds and actions, but by the light that's coming and shining from our deeds and actions. And that will have an eternal impact. And then the second one is, we don't need to keep reliving our sins over and over again. We don't have to keep reliving our mistakes, the things that we regret. Because by turning things around and changing our lives, we ourselves are putting our hand in the water and changing the ripple. And that will have a greater effect in the long run than wallowing in self-pity and thinking about the bad things that we've done or the bad things that have happened to us. I can't promise you that everything is always going to be okay. But I can promise you that if you build your relationship with God, He will always help you find a way out. That's my thought for today, and I leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.